hallelujah loving heavenly father this is our prayer tonight come holy spirit revive your church today we open our hearts to you and we ask father that you will do what you see fit we humble ourselves and we recognize that without you we are nothing and so tonight oh god we didn't come to hear the words of human beings we came to hear your word and so father do what needs to be done trouble us make us uneasy whatever you need to do to save us oh god go ahead and do it and so we surrender to you i surrender to you in Jesus' name we pray amen and amen may be seated in the presence of the lord hallelujah powerlessness is not an option we have looked at uh, the key text uh, you repeated it earlier this evening if we will repeat the key text one more time acts chapter 1 and verse 8 the key text for our series acts chapter 1 verse 8 the word of god says but you shall receive after that the holy ghost has come upon and you shall be witnesses unto in jerusalem and and samaria and to the end of the earth tonight i'm concerned about the first part of that uh, key text but you shall receive power after the holy ghost has come upon you powerlessness is not an option I'd like you to turn with me to Matthew chapter 17, and then we're going to go to Mark chapter 9. There is an account in the Synoptic Gospels that's in Matthew and in Mark. Uh, there are some slight differences in the story. We're going to read both versions of the story as we reflect on the topic, powerlessness is not an option. Uh, Matthew chapter 17, we're going to read verses 14 through 21, Matthew chapter 17. 17. The account comes just after Jesus' transfiguration experience in the mountain, the Mount of Transfiguration, where Jesus is transfigured and Moses and Elijah came by and, and, and the disciples behold uh, the inner circle, they behold this awesome, this glorious experience, this transformation of Jesus to the extent that they wanted to build temples there and they wanted to remain there. When they come down, when they came down from the mountain, they found themselves confronted with a difficult reality. We pick up the story in verse 14. Would you follow with me in the word of God as we go through? The word of God says, and when they had come to the multitude. Now, one of the things you're going to realize if you read the Gospels closely is that whenever you see multitude in the Gospel, either just before or just after, there will be reference to mountain. Are we together, everybody? That there will be mountain, then multitude, or multitude, then mountain. And I'll share with you the significance in a moment. So they came down from the mountain. They met the multitude. And the Bible says that a man came to him, kneeling down to him, saying, Lord, have mercy on my son, for he is an epileptic and suffers severely, for he often falls into the fire and often into the water. So I brought him to your disciples but they could not cure him then Jesus answered and said oh faithless and perverse generation how long shall I be with you how long shall I bear with you bring him here to me and Jesus rebuked the demon and it came out of him and the child was cured from that very hour then the disciples came to Jesus privately and said why could we not cast it out and Jesus said to them because of your unbelief for assuredly I say to you if you have faith as a mustard seed seed you shall say to this mountain move from here to there and it will move and nothing will be impossible for you however 
this kind does not go out except by prayer and fasting. Somebody say hallelujah. hallelujah. Let's go to Mark's version of this story. And I'd like us to read together. Read from whatever version you have. I'm reading from the New King James Version. Mark chapter 9. And we begin in verse 14. Again, it comes after the transfiguration of Jesus on the mountain. And now we have some slightly different details about this story. Shall we read together? Are we there? Mark chapter 9. Mark chapter 9. Are you there? If you're there, say amen. amen. Hallelujah. Together. And when he came to the disciples, he saw a great multitude around them and scribes disputing with them. Immediately when they saw him, all the people were greatly amazed and running to him, greeted him. And he asked the scribes, what are you discussing with them? And one of the crowd answered and said, teacher, I brought you my son who has a mute spirit. And wherever it seizes him it throws him down he foams at the mouth gnashes his teeth and becomes rigid so I spoke to your disciples that they should cast it out notice the slight difference in the Matthew's version he was brought so that he could be cured Mark gives us a little more details he did not just come for a cure for his son he came for deliverance for his son and the Bible says but they could not. Matthew and Mark uses different uh, Greek words to uh, emphasize this. In, 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 in Matthew, the word simply means that they were incapable of doing what was asked of them. In Mark, the word that is used indicates that it was impossible for them to do what they were asked to do. We together, everybody. Let's continue in verse 19. The Bible says, he answered him and said, O faithless generation, how long shall I be with you how long shall I bear with you bring him to me then they brought him to him and when he saw him immediately the spirit convulsed him and he fell on the ground and wallowed foaming at the mouth so he asked his father how long has this been happening to him and he said from childhood and often he has thrown both thrown him both into the fire and into the water to destroy him. But if you can do anything, have compassion on us and help us. Jesus said to him, if you can believe, all things are possible to him who believes. Immediately the father of the child cried out and cried out and said with tears, Lord, I believe, help my unbelief. Mm. When Jesus saw that the people came running together, he rebuked the unclean spirit, saying to it, deaf and dumb spirit, I command you, come out of him and enter him no more. Hallelujah. Then the spirit cried out, convulsed him greatly, and came out of him, and he became as one dead. So many said he is dead, but Jesus took him by the hand and lifted him up, and he arose, and when he came into the house, his disciples asked him privately, why could we not cast it out? So he said to them, this kind can come out by nothing but prayer and fasting. Powerlessness is not an option. Spirituality is not individualistic. Spirituality is not disconnected from other aspects of our lives. In fact, spirituality is not separate from our sphere of influence. Spirituality is not our devotional life. Spirituality is our lives. We don't have a secular life and a sacred life. We only have a sacred life. Are we together, everybody? Spirituality is not one facet of life. It is the totality of our lives. We cannot compartmentalize our lives as Christians we need to recognize that spirituality is the complete the total package of our lives when we compartmentalize our lives it leads to what I call dangerous hybrids what hybrids am I talking about I'm talking about hybrids like racist Christians 
Are, are we together, everybody? And, 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 and unless we run too far, that, that is a reality that our church grapples with, that, that I still don't understand how good, committed Adventist Christians can be racist at the same time. My first encounter, my first major encounter with racism came when I was at Andrews University. I'm registering and, and I, I'm, I'm sent to uh, the North American Division Evangelistic Institute to register for them to assign me to a church. And, and I, I followed what, what, what the poster said. I went to the director. When I went to the director's office, he says, I don't deal with your kind. What do you mean? someone that would attend to you. What do you mean, sir? The notice says that I should come to you. He says, young man, go down the hall and, that, and, and the person there would assign you to a church. I said, sir, it doesn't matter which church I'm assigned to. I'm, a, I'm an Adventist. He says, young man, go down. When I went down, I, I recognized that the person to whom he sent me looked like me. We're together, everybody. I did a class with 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 the gentleman who 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 was uh, the prime author of the Twenty Seven Fundamental Beliefs. He wrote the main text, and and in the class, uh, because I did not put my photograph in the past, he couldn't tell whether I was black or white, and because my last name is Dutch, he thought that I was from Europe. And so throughout the class, he would say, Jansen is doing very well. If, if you have questions, then uh, talk to Jansen. He's doing well, and, and I'm working hard. And midterm, he says, who is Jansen? And I made the mistake of putting my hands up. The blood drained from his face. That was the last moment that he called my name in the class. I worked harder. I worked harder. I gave him more assignment than he required, and he still gave me a B plus because that was the highest that students of color could get in his class. Whenever we compartmentalize spirituality, we have dangerous hybrids like racist Christians. When we don't understand the essence of spirituality, we have things like, like, like uh, corrupt or immoral Adventists, out of control believers, fanatical saints, unholy disciples. These are the kinds of hybrids that come when we compartmentalize spirituality. There were four different sects during the time of Jesus Christ and they all had messed up spirituality. The Pharisees, a version of spirituality, made themselves righteous separatists. They thought that they were better than everyone else. And yet when you look at their lifestyle, these were some of the most immoral people during the time of Christ. They felt comfortable stepping over people. They felt comfortable destroying people's lives. Yet they could boast that they paid tithe on everything that they got and fasted twice a week. And, and they went through all of these rituals. Yet they were not transformed. They were religious, but they were not spiritual. The second group were the Sadducees, and they were arrogant compromisers. They compromised with Hellenistic culture. They, they went into all of their political games in order to get the high priestly position. And yet they considered themselves to be religious. But when you look at the Sadducees and you look at the Pharisees, they can kill Jesus and think they're doing God a favor. The third group is a group that we, we, we don't know too much about. The zealots and these were those who believed that they could bring about God's kingdom by force. And so they used what they called righteous indignation. They will pick up the sword in a moment and they will do battle to establish the physical, literal kingdom of God. For the zealots, God's kingdom was not a heavenly kingdom. And today we have many zealots who are so full of zeal that they're willing to destroy people in the name of God so that they can get to their accomplished end. The third, the fourth group was called the Essenes and we get the 
Dead Sea Scrolls from them. And when you look at their history and you look at their theology, they felt that spirituality was pulling themselves away from society because society was so evil and messed up. They had their own community out in the desert. They did not interact with anyone else. In fact, they felt that they were God's chosen people and no one else was a child of God. They were so separate that they became irrelevant to we together, everybody. Ellen White says in Steps to Christ, page 101, in the section entitled Prayer Without Earnest Activity for Others Leads to Formalism, here is what she says, God does not mean that any of us should become hermits or monks and retire from the world to devote ourselves to acts of worship. The life must be like Christ's life between the mountain and the multitude. Are we together, everybody? He who does nothing but pray will soon cease to pray, or his prayers will become a formal routine. When men take themselves out of social life, away from the sphere of Christian duty and the cross bearing, when they cease to work earnestly, when they seek to work earnestly for the master who worked earnestly for them, they lose the subject matter of prayer and have no incentive to devotion. Their prayers become personal and selfish. They cannot pray in regard to the wants of humanity or the building of Christ's kingdom, pleading for strength wherewith to work. In other words, spirituality that does not take us into the world to serve is problematic spirituality. If spirituality doesn't lead us to transform the world around us, then it is not genuine spirituality. Understand that spirituality is not a part of my life. My whole life is spiritual. And so when I am a father, I am being spiritual. When I'm a, being a husband, I am spiritual. When I'm being a good neighbor, I'm being spiritual. Every aspect of my life is informed by my spirituality. Are we together, everybody? Spirituality is not being a hermit. It is not withdrawing from society. That is why I have a problem with a lot of those offshoot fanatical Adventist groups. They get together and they will spend hours studying to correct the church and spend very little time actually going out and meeting the needs of those in the society. Jesus says you shall receive power. The power that he gives us is a power within a particular context. It is power to serve. It is power to transform. It is not power to hoard. It is power to change the world around us. Understand why this power is necessary. This power is necessary because according to Ephesians 6 and verse 12, we wrestle not against flesh and blood against principalities, against powers, against the rulers of this dark world, against spiritual wickedness in heavenly places, in high places. It suggests to me that our gospel commission comes within the context of the great controversy. We cannot fulfill the great controversy without understanding that we are in spiritual warfare, meaning that the devil will do everything within his power to prevent the advancement of the kingdom of God. This therefore means that those who are God's children who don't have power, they are a liability to the kingdom of God. Mm. Now let me push this a step further. When God asks us to do something, he gives us the power to do what he has asked us to do. And he specifically says, I need to give you power so that you can be my witnesses. Don't go out until you receive my power. Because understand the battles that you're going to fight. You're going to fight a battle against a foe. A foe who does not function by any kind of rules. He will do everything within his power to make sure that he, keep, he keeps captives bound. Recognize that even right now, as we are in this process of revival, and remember, the revival is not the sermon. The revival is us coming together and praying. In the process of revival, the devil is planning how to get you. He is planning how to 
stop you. He's planning how to get in the midst of uh, uh, the pastors in the Boston area. We have come together and we're planning a, a joint evangelistic meeting uh, for the month of July. And, and today I got some calls and, and already the enemy is coming in and trying to bring division in the camp. Recognize what is at stake. At stake, the stakes are high. Souls are in captive. They are enslaved by the enemy. And the fact that you can preach the gospel if you don't have power, those souls will continue to be enslaved. Why am I telling you this? I I learned this lesson some years ago, and it challenged me. I I, I had taken about four days to pray and fast. I'd gone into a mountainous area and, and then I was there in the quietness just meditating and praying and fasting. You know, when you get on that kind of high, you don't want to leave there. You want to stay there. And, and, and I wanted to just stay and, and bask in the presence of God. But, but there was a youth camp that I had to do a devotion for. And, and, and I was upset that I needed to break my time of contemplation to go and minister to young people. And so I, 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 someone was taking me uh, to the camp and so they came to get me. I got to the camp and my plan was I was just going to give the message that God had given to me. I told the driver, I need you to stop the car. As soon as I'm done, I am running out and I'm going back to the mountain. The message was through and I made an appeal that I knew only one person or two might respond to. I said to the, to the audience, those of you who have a broken relationship with God and right now you are lost, you don't have a relationship with God, you are lost. I'm talking to you. I need you to come to the altar. I'm like, this is going to cut short my appeal. I opened my eyes and there were only two persons left in their seats. Everyone else was at the altar. Amen. And I'm thinking to myself, man, I, I want to get out of this place. I, I prayed and, and after I prayed, I'm, I'm trying to run out. And one of the young people came and said, Pastor, could you hold a minute? And then, and, 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 and as, as, as he said, hold a minute, I sat and I'm talking with him and he tells me his story. And as he tells me his story, my heart is ripped in pieces as I hear the pain that he is going through after him. One by one, several youth came and I'm praying with them and ministering with them, to them. And God then impressed on my heart, understand your prayer is not just for you, it is for them. That I need you to be strong, not just for yourself, but there are others out there who are in desperate need of your ministry. I have empowered you, not just for you to feel good about your spiritual life. I have empowered you because there are men and women out there who need to hear God, God's word through you. My perspective had to change. That spirituality was not just about me, but lives hang in the balance based on my spirituality, based on your spirituality. Are we together, everybody? Ellen White says in Testimonies, Volume 8, page 22, why do we not hunger and thirst for the gift of the Spirit? Since this is the means by which we receive power, why do we not talk of it, pray for it, preach concerning it? The Lord is more willing to give the Holy Spirit to us than parents are to give good gifts to their children. For the baptism of the Spirit, every worker should be pleading with God. Companies should gather together to ask for special help, for heavenly wisdom, that they may know how to plan and execute wisely. This is the only power that we have the power of the Holy Spirit. Are we together, everybody? Now, in this context, let's go into our passage. And I'm going to go in and out of Matthew's version and Mark's version of the story. <coughs> the enemy of our souls is out to kill, steal, and destroy. The enemy is no respecter of persons. Regardless of who you are or how old 
you are. The enemy will get you by all means necessary. He will get to you. The enemy is so crafty that he is going to plant seeds in your mind because it is not his aim for you to fall right now. He just needs a foothold in your mind. And so whenever he is ready, he is going to just pull the plug. Jesus has just come down from the mountain. The mountain is a symbol of where he spends his time with his father. It's, it's the place where he spends time in prayer. He gets power in the mountain. Are we together, everybody? He gets power in the mountain so that he can go back to the valley and meet the multitude. And so he can minister to the multitude. Without the mountain, you can't minister to the multitude. Are we together, everybody? If you don't have mountain time with God, then you cannot effectively minister to the needs of those who are in the valley. Neither can you fulfill the will and the purpose of God, Jesus, no matter how busy his life got. He took time to pray. He can come to the end of a very long day and he would still steal away and he will pray sometimes. He will spend the entire night in prayer. Early in the morning he will find a quiet place and there he would pray. He did not break his mountain time with his father. Are we together everybody? Because understand it is not every need that the multitude has that you need to minister to. And only if you've spent time in the mountain can you determine which needs the father wants you to minister to. Amen. And we're together, everybody. And so Jesus comes down. He has been transfigured. He is now empowered. And he becomes the example. He comes down. And, and as he comes down, there is a discussion that is taking place among the multitude. Matthew doesn't tell us this, but Mark tells us there are some scribes that are there. And so there's a religious debate and discussion that is taking place. But in the midst of this, here comes a father. And the father comes with his little son, his son, and he comes to Jesus and, and puts his son before the Savior. And he's asking the Savior for help. There are a few things that I need you to notice in the story. The first thing I need you to notice in the story is that Jesus is already prepared for the need before the need was presented to him. Are we together, everybody? He's prepared for the need because he has spent time tarrying with his father. Many times as a church, we are not prepared to meet needs because we have not spent time tarrying with the father. Needs arise and we cannot minister to the needs because we have not been connecting with the father. We need to maintain unbroken Union with heaven. Spirituality is not something that I go into and out of. It is the way I live every second of every day. I must be prepared because the devil is always prepared. You don't know what will come your way. You don't know what challenge the enemy will send your way. You don't know whose life hangs in the balance. And so the first thing I want you to notice is that Jesus is prepared. The second thing that I need you to notice is the family reality in the story. The father is religious. We don't know if he is from a scribal family. And Mark seems to indicate this, but we're not sure. But his son is not only physically sick, but more importantly, his son is possessed by a demon. Here is why this is significant. That his son is possessed by a demon and the father is unable to do anything about it. Says that daddy is powerless. Now let that sink in for a moment. That your child is demon possessed suggests that mom and dad When Jesus asked him, how long has this been going on? He says, from the time he was a little child, from childhood. How does he have access to Satan? How does Satan have access to him? Understand, when you have a strong man of the house, the thief cannot come in because the strong man is ready. If there is no strong man in the house, then the thief can come in at any time. If daddy and mommy are not where they need to be spiritually, then the devil has an open door. Let that sink in. You 
usually mothers are the ones who brought their children to Jesus. We have a couple examples of fathers who came to Jesus on behalf of their children. It had to be desperate for daddy to bring his boy to the Lord, recognizing that part of what my son is going through is a reflection of my own brokenness. Because if my home were covered the way it was supposed to be, if I were praying the way that I should, if mom and dad were constantly under the spirit and they were vigilant, Satan could not come in. Pastor Dowding, you remember in Martinique <coughs> when we did that evangelistic campaign, we got a call. This mother desperate. Her 13 year old child possessed. Myself, Pastor Dowling, and another minister, we went to minister to that family. We, we heard about her story. And she had made some choices that she wasn't supposed to make. She had gone to some places that she wasn't supposed to, to go to. And, and now her child is possessed. When we got to the home, we got report that this 13 year old child was lifting up a huge couch. There were knives in the kitchen and, and she was picking up the knives and she said the voice in her told her to stab her little brother and stab her mother. As we interacted with her, we saw her playing with her thumbs and, and as we as we interviewed and asked a little, I uh, asked a few more questions, she said that before we came there, the voice in her told her that the pastors were going to come and the voice told her that she needed to perform a few different signs and when she performed the signs, the voice told her that the pastors were going to be destroyed. Have mercy. If we went there and we were not prepared, we would have been in serious trouble. But what shocked me is as we prayed with her and we got to the root of this, she says to us, I was looking at a cartoon, Sabrina the Teenage Witch. And she says, I was repeating the chants that were in the cartoon as I repeated the, the chants and the, and the spells in the cartoon. She says, something came out of the TV and came into, the, into me and I became Sabrina. And she says, I started repeating the spells over my eight-year-old brother. Now, Mom, I know that you've been through a lot. Dad, I know that you've been through a lot. But if you are not fitting what your children look at, the devil is going to take over. If you are not mindful of what you let your children look at or listen to what you allow to come into your house, you will find yourself with a child that is completely under the control of the devil. Satan is not going to wait until they get to university to get them. By the time your child gets to three or four, Sesame Street has already polluted their minds. Are we together, everybody? By the time they go to preschool, and they have an unconsecrated teacher who now instructs them. They spend more time with that unconsecrated teacher than they spend with you. By the time your child gets to middle school, your child begins to lose their desire for God. By the time they get to college, have mercy. The damage has already been done and we begin to cry out. Jesus, help! I've lost my child! My challenge with this text is that the father, the mother, she is not mentioned in the story. They are both powerless. They cannot afford to be powerless when your children's destinies are at stake. How can you as parents, how can we as parents be powerless when the souls of our children hang in the balance? Amen. How could dad be out committing adultery when children's salvation? 
salvation or hanging in the balance. How can mom be hooked on soap operas? And but the devil is working over time to destroy your children. I also want you to notice in the text the powerlessness of the disciples. This is before Pentecost. Daddy says, since I couldn't do it, I, I, I did the next best thing. I, I brought them to your disciples. Not just the disciples, your disciples. They claim to follow you. They walk with you. They are yours. And so as your representatives, I took for granted that because they were called by your name, they could do what you do.
when we nurture hypocrisy and call it remnant, we feed right into the trap of the enemy. I also want you to notice in the text the intentions of the enemy. So the disciples compromise their spirituality. Jesus tells them they don't have, they, they have unbelief, they don't have enough faith, they, they're not connected as they should. What they're failing to recognize is that the plan of the enemy is to destroy that child. The father says, the enemy has tried to destroy my boy. Every opportunity he gets, he throws him in the fire, throws him in the water in order to destroy him. Now I want you to notice, the only reason the father is able to protect his child is not so much because he is where he needs to be spiritually, but because he is there to pull his son out of the fire, out of the water. But that's all he could do. He cannot deliver his child. What do I mean by this? <clears throat> Every soul that you come into contact with, the devil has a hit out for them. In fact, the devil has a hit out on you. Oh, we're together, everybody. And any opportunity that he gets to destroy, he will. But, but, but as you prepare for this evangelistic meeting, Move in your life. 
But Jesus goes a step further. I love the way Matthew says it. Jesus says, I need you to understand that if you have faith the size of a mustard seed, you can say to the mountain, move from here to there and it shall be moved. What is Jesus saying? Jesus is saying what the servant of the Lord says. The weakest sinner on his or her knees causes the devil to tremble. Understand, you don't need faith the size of a mountain. You just need faith the size of a mustard seed. And it doesn't matter who you are. If you have faith in God, when you get down on your knees and you call in the name of God, you have access to the omnipotence of Almighty God. The devil trembles when he sees you on his knees. Daddy, 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 what you need to understand is when you see your boy tormented by
Because whatever you feed on becomes your default nature. That is what you draw on in times of need. So if all you have fed yourself with is what Hollywood has presented to you, a kingdom divided against itself cannot stand. There is no way that Hollywood would plan to get you closer to Christ. It is not to their advantage. Because the closer you get to Christ, they will go out to business. My heart pains as I see the church so caught up in politics without the power of God. I've told this story perhaps hundreds of times. My heart shook. Some years ago, I was preparing to be a missionary. And one missionary who had come back from Rwanda shared this story. She had met a pastor's wife. And the pastor's wife told the story that during the, the social unrest in Rwanda, the head elder of one of the churches, who was from the aggressive tribe, he came into their house, chopped off the neck of the pastor, chopped off the neck of his two sons, was about to do that to the wife. She raised her hand up, her hand got chopped off. She got a mark on her neck. He thought that she was dead too. My heart churned within me. How could a good Adventist do this? And as I asked myself the question, I then found out that a conference president, the president of the West Rwanda Conference, and his son, who was trained at Loma Linda University, who was a medical doctor, and that the people from the other tribe asked for their protection and help. They were fellow Adventists. The president said, there is nothing that I can do to help you prepare to die. They were all staying at conference property. The president and his son went and got people from their tribe. They all came back with machete in hand and destroyed just about every one of their fellow Christians. What causes us to be so close around Jesus should not be transformed. Jesus gives the answer. This guy only comes out by prayer and fasting. What does that mean? Until we move from mediocre Adventism, genocide lives in every one of us. Until we move from simply hanging around Jesus to passionately seeking after God in prayer and fasting. Fill me, God. Fill me. I need you. Transform me. I am not satisfied with a superficial relationship with you. I need you to transfigure me. I need you to transform me. Until we tarry with God in the mountain. Until we experience his transforming power. Genocide lives in every one of us. If you think I'm lying, Jesus warns us that our worst enemies will be those of our own household. Jesus warns us that many from within the faith will think that they're doing God a favor by giving you over to be persecuted and by killing you. That's from the inside. Church of the living God, powerlessness is not an option. There is too much at stake. The little girl that Pastor Downing and myself and the other pastor prayed for, we saw the hand of God in her life. She was delivered. Amen. 
At that same meeting, Pastor Dowding, you remember, this young lady came to the altar, one of our deliverance services. She came to the pastor who was beside me. He was the assistant pastor, the associate uh, 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 evangelist. And I heard her as she said to him, I just came to the altar to let you know there is nothing your God can do to deliver me. And I said to the pastor, don't deal with this right now. We're going to pray with her, with the prayer group at the back. Ask her to come to the prayer group. We're not going to give the enemy an opportunity to embarrass God's people. Mm -hmm. And so we took her to the back after the meeting. I spent some time in prayer before I came into that tent. And as I got into the tent, she, she rushed toward me to choke my neck and rebuked her in the name of Jesus. And I realized she was laughing at our prayer group. And I realized something was not right. And so I said to her, go home. You'll come back tomorrow. Prayer group, I need you to spend the night in prayer. Confess your faults to the Lord. Hallelujah. Make things right with him. That yes, you might have been messed up, but you can change course. Hallelujah. Thank God for grace. Spend the night praying and seeking God and making things right. The lady came back the following night and we prayed over her and we saw the power of God as demons left her. She was liberated by the power of Almighty God and she tells her story and we were all challenged by her story. She was raised in the church and an elder from the church raped her and the church took the side of the elder and called her a slut. The wonder the church was powerless. But when we got together and we made things right with God, that lady who was now in her 30s and was possessed since she was 14 years old, she received the power of God and the chains were broken. Imagine. Imagine what would have happened if the church had remained powerless. Someone possessed, longing of the inmost being to be free, coming, because demons don't want to come to church where Jesus is lifted up. It is only the power of God that will bring her to the tent. Amen, amen. And God brought her there because he needed the church to recognize that he needed to tap into the power. How many times? Have people come into your sphere of influence, possessed by the enemy, and they left even more possessed because you could not. How many times you've watched your children possessed and you could not? Tonight I have two simple invitations. One, parents. God calls you to stand guard over your family. Grandparents, fathers and mothers, it is time for you to take back your family from the enemy. Amen. It is time for you to say, Satan, enough is enough. Take your hands off of my child. Take your hands off of my son. Take your hands off of my daughter. Take your hands off of my marriage in the name of Jesus. for us to begin crying out to God to receive his power. So parents tonight, if you have a child, a young child or an adult child that you're concerned about and you are committed by God's grace to start doing battle under the banner of Prince Emmanuel for the salvation of your children. Even if your children seem fine, okay, right now, but, but, but you want to make sure that they are protected by the hand of God. I'm gonna ask parents to stand tonight. Your sons and daughters, Give them over to the Savior. Hallelujah. The best thing that that father could have done was to bring his boy. And though the church failed, Jesus did not fail. Jesus did not fail. Hallelujah. Bring your children to the Lord. Give them over. 
it is not too late. As long as they have life, there is still hope. Jehovah, do battle for our sons and our daughters. My second invitation is for disciples. Those who are serious about being disciples, if you recognize right now that the power that needs to flow through you doesn't, as it should, that your prayer life is not where it needs to be, that your spirituality is compartmentalized and, and that it doesn't transform your life as a father, your life as a husband, a life as a wife, life as a mother, life as a son, life as a daughter. If it doesn't transform every facet, if right now you know that where God wants you to be, you are not there. I need you to raise your hands right where you are. Raise your hands. Raise your hands. Take them down. Here is what we're going to do. Be honest, you can play all to Jesus. I surrender. We're going to pray in groups of twos. And I want you to pray if you have parents in your group, pray as parents and as disciples. Pray for your children and pray for your own spirituality. That it will go beyond the devotional life that you have. And your spirituality would become a way of life. Powerlessness is not an option. Your neighbors depend on you having power. Your children depend on you having the power of God. Your workmates and classmates depend on you having the power of God. The people that you meet every single day. The song by Steve Green says, every day they pass me by, I can see it in their eyes. Empty people filled with pain, heading who knows where. On they go through private pain, living fear to fear, left to hide. Their silent cries, only Jesus hears people need the Lord. When will we realize people need the Lord? We are called to take his light to a world where Rome seems right. What could be to great a cost for sharing light with one who is lost? Through his love, our hearts can feel all the pain, all the grief they bear. They must hear the words of life. Only Jesus care. People need the Lord. Hallelujah. I need you to get in groups of twos. And I need you to cry out to God. God, he says, if you have faith, like mustard seed, you can move mountains. He said, this kind only comes out by prayer and fasting. Take the time to intercede that God will break chains so that you will become a vessel of power. Groups of twos everywhere. You don't have to pray with the person just next to you. You can find somebody else. But I need you to get in groups of twos. And I need you to pray. <coughs> I need you to pray need you to pray. Pray as parents. Pray as disciples. 